Welcome, friends, to the Someone Gets Me podcast. I am your host, Diane Allen, and I am so delighted that you're here. This podcast was created because I believe there is a visionary leader inside each one of us who is waiting to be seen. In each episode of Someone Gets Me, you will hear useful tips from successful visionaries who will share their stories about how being seen has allowed them to take their vision out into the world with action. Welcome everybody to Someone Gets Me. Today's show is called The Effects of Good Lighting on Daily Life. You know, I talk about being a lighthouse all the time and I talk about the importance of light. So I thought nothing better than to find myself one of the lead lighting directors around. I have with us today, Rhiannon Rodriguez-Betts. Now I've known her for a while and boy is Rhiannon a blast. And she's also one of the most talented lighting directors that there is around. She can build a stage. She can host the hospitality. She can do the lighting for the shows and many other things. So we have a multi-potentialite gifted person. And in her same body, we have a creative genius and somebody who's like technically a geek. If you could have seen what she went through just to set up for this interview, you would understand that sometimes that nuance of knowing, knowing things with precision combined with creativity makes for a great experience. So Rhiannon's taking time out of her busy day after having worked most of the night last night on a show to be with us today to talk about lighting and life and being gifted and being a multi-potentialite. So Rhiannon, thank you so much for coming on the show today and welcome to Someone Gets Me. Thank you so much for the warm welcome, Diane. I appreciate it. I'm so excited to have you here because I use all these lighting <laughs> reference points all the time and I am like not the expert. I can tell you if the lighting is good or I like it. I know when I've traveled with some musicians, they talk a lot about the lighting for their show and I appreciate it when I'm in the audience as well. And I also know that the nuance and the precision of it is far beyond my understanding. So I have great respect for it. So I have lots of questions for you. <laughs> yeah, I love uh, answering questions. But the first one is, how did you get into this whole lighting thing? Like, what, how, tell us a little bit about how this all got started, because I just think it's very fascinating um, as a career anyway. And you've done so many things. What, what got you started? Well, when I was like five, I wanted to be a singer or an actress. I wanted to be Michael Jackson or Madonna, you know, as everyone my age, I think probably did when they were five. (laughs) And, (laughs) and so, so I kept pursuing that, you know, I was in choir and theater. And while I was in theater, we had to take production classes in high school. Mm -hmm. And I discovered that running sound came with way a lot of a lot of very high tension and I wasn't really into that (laughs) (laughs) so I I started lighting plays and doing different concerts and the Navy band came to play at my theater it was in Twin Falls Idaho and then the spotlight operator went ill or didn't show up or something. And my boyfriend uh, at the time brought me dinner. And I was like, hey, guess what I would love for you to take care of for me. And so <laughs> so I taught him how to run a spotlight in about 20 minutes. And then when the band went to play, usually there's a orchestra shell behind the band, a band shell. Mm-hmm. Right. And then uh, more often than not, they'd close the curtains behind it. So it'd be a black backdrop. So this particular time, Someone failed to do that. So the psych was open. And I was like, well, I can't waste this opportunity. I better make the psych look different colors for the Navy band. And so I just started improvisingly playing lights with the band. And nobody came and said not to do that. And uh, off I ran with that. And afterward, they came up and were like, oh my God, that was the most amazing experience like you guys treated us like such professionals and that was the greatest feeling show like we don't know what you did but that was so great and like usually the spotlight operators have had 10 minutes of training and they have no idea what they're doing and I was like all right well I updid it by 10 minutes so 
obviously. You know, I'm doing double the effort of most folks around the world, country or world. I mean, I suppose they go around the world. And then, uh, you know, a few months went by and the school got a letter from Bill Clinton thanking us for taking such very good care of his band. I thought to myself, well, if the president uh, is appeased by my my activities, I should probably keep this up. So, uh, so I did. That's how I got started. Oh, that is a great story. <laughs> I love it. And that's that that's that part of being technical and then took the opportunity to let the creativity show up within the technical part. And it created something magical that that people probably still remember to this day. You know, yeah, that's really, really fun. So what has been your biggest lesson that you've learned over all these years and all these concerts and all these venues and all of this work, when you look over your career and you look over your experience as a director in lighting, what's one of your biggest lessons that you've learned? I think to keep calm. You know, like there's always, there's always a catastrophe at hand in the entertainment industry. And also one of my favorite sayings is that uh, why work in the entertainment industry if it isn't entertaining? Like if you don't find it to be entertaining, then you should probably go find something else to do. You know, it's a, there's a whole lot of a whole lot of uh, opportunity to be downtrodden or upset, and I just try to anytime those sorts of things are happening, be like, you know, let's let's find something else to do with our time besides be upset. And, and let's, let's find the entertainment in, in whatever it is that we're doing. You know, if, it, if we're sitting around waiting for something to happen for several hours or, you know, or if there's, you know, the most memorable um, moment for me, um, I was like, whenever anybody asks me, like, what's your favorite show that you've ever seen? Because that's a, a favorite question that a lot of folks ask, right? My favorite show that I have ever seen was uh, Tony Bennett. And it had nothing to do with Tony Bennett. He was amazing. It was a fabulous show. But the reason that it was so amazing to me was because Sharon Jones, who had just played, uh, was standing next to me. And she was like so excited that she grabbed a hold of my shirt. I was wearing a t-shirt, of course. And she was just like jumping up and down, yanking my shirt around like, do you see that Tony Bennett is right there and he's just killing it? I'm like, yeah. And I have seen you several times killing it way more than this Tony Bennett guy. He's <laughs> not, he doesn't dance like James Brown, you know? Like, And she was just so excited and so entertained, probably to keep calm, but to be entertained. I appreciate all the entertainment and everything along with it, right? Yeah. So... You have to be a really good problem solver in what you do, because I imagine there's all kinds of things that, that can happen. And even during the show, before the show, setting up for the show, during the show, like anything can happen. Have you ever been in a situation where like the power went out? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the most memorable time that the power went out, the lights quit working um, for the Doobie Brothers. It was uh, September 6th. Uh, eight years ago. So whatever that math is, uh, I just turned 30. All the lights had gone down. There were LED lights. I went around to the backstage and I saw a rigger coming out from underneath the stage. So I thought that he had perhaps knocked out the Edison plug that powered the LEDs. So I went to um, make sure they were firmly plugged in and did not realize that... Um, the pass-throughs on the dimmer, which is a big electrical connection to go to another box, um, was not blocked. And the middle leg, the black leg of the of the um, forot grabbed a hold of my middle finger and shocked me. And uh, I didn't die or anything. <laughs> I ran around to the front of the stage. <laughs> and, uh, and the LD uh, was like, uh, this is the weirdest thing. The light board just reset itself. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's probably just because I shocked myself. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> and I reset the light board. And, uh, and uh, you know, well, it had reset itself. So when it came back on, 
uh, you know, nothing, nothing just magically came on. So I put down all the faders and put them all back up and all the lights came back on. And I was like, there you go, Steve, I fixed the lights. And then meandered off and had a good friend of mine come over and be like, Anna, you, you look a little funny. All right. No, I don't, I don't, I don't know. And he started asking me what two plus two was. And I was like, uh-oh, this doesn't sound good. But uh, it, it turned out pretty all right. That's really, really fun. I love that story. <laughs> I know you probably have a thousand of stories, but I also want to talk about like good, really good lighting. Like, you know, it's it's funny because I have a great appreciation for really good lighting. But if you were to ask me in any any moment, like how it got like that, like how that turned out that beautiful or that way, I would not be able to answer that question because I don't have the technical knowledge that you do. But what I'd like you to speak to a little bit, and maybe you even have a story or two that might even illustrate it, is I'll bet when you're in the audience, you notice if the lighting's really good or not, right? And you know how to make the artist or the 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 feel of whatever the event is come alive for the people using light, which is not easy to do. So we speak a little bit to the value of that in a show or in life in general, the value of good lighting and how come you pay attention with the precision that you do to have really good skill and knowledge and good lighting for the shows you do. I feel like, like what I do is akin to playing an instrument right mm-hmm. so but except kind of a lot of instruments at once so maybe sort of like a dj like jazz for me like i i often don't get a whole lot of planning uh you know i get a sound check so i get to know what it is that we're doing more or less and then uh and then the show so um so I inevitably, like I do a whole lot of focusing. I go in and take uh, a lot of attention to how the lights are pointed at everybody and make sure that there's not shadows where they're going to likely hang out. And if, uh, if they're going to, you know, like bass players, for example, often uh, figure out where there is no light on stage and go and solo there. And that makes my brain get really upset. <laughs> <laughs> so I try to make sure that there's no absolute dark spots so that I can be able to uh, light things up uh, anywhere that I need to. And um, prior to the invention of having moving lights all over the entire uh, rig, that was a lot trickier. Right. So, um, yeah, so I, I put a, a lot of attention on making sure that I've got uh as much light as possible from you know multiple directions so that everything can be as even as possible and um and sometimes that's not how it works at all you know sometimes sometimes like oh man i am gonna forget his name and i'm gonna blame the shocking uh at the doobie brothers for it but um there's um there's this amazing artist um, who uh, um, would come in and he would have me um, put a lamp on one side and make sure that half of his face was lit. He was like really, really concerned with making sure that that like half of his face was in shadow and half of it was lit. And so I would spend hours making sure that whatever, however it was that he wanted it, that he was happy with it. And I would take a picture for him and show him how it was looking, you know, like I, I, I want to make sure that whatever it is that the artist wants, they get, you know, like I, I remember once for M Ward, he didn't want any front light and like the audience got upset that they couldn't see the stage. I'm like, Oh, what's M Ward lets me know that he's changed his mind on this stance we're going to be backlighting him, you know? And um, sometimes I get a little sassy about that. Like rappers will, will, will be like, black out the lights, black out the lights. All right. So I shut them off. And they'll be like, 
rapping, rapping, rapping. And they'll be like, well, turn the lights back on. I'm like, well, all right. I mean, if you're going to orchestrate the situation from the stage, like I, I try to make sure that we discuss these things beforehand. So right. um, if, if from stage people start uh, improvingly directing me, then I expect them to keep it up. Um, I have a really great friend that, uh, that really enjoys uh, doing that. And, and he'll, he, he has made me do all sorts of creative things that I never would have thought of doing um where he's like and i want some lightning right now and i'll make it happen you know and so yeah so basically just paying attention to what it is that people want and um <laughs> trying to make sure to give it to them i love it so do you use your intuition yes yes very much so like often I, i've done a whole lot of of folk singers um and and so i would listen to the story and listen to the chords and hear the tuning change and say okay i think we're gonna get happy with this next song oh no i feel like we're gonna probably gonna get a little melancholy here so i do a whole lot of trying to anticipate what it, where it is that we're going um so that i can um compliment wherever we're going right, so you can use the lighting to match the mood yeah which is how we use it in our our light you know in our life like you know if i want it to be softer or lighter or happier or up or color is really amazing right and so i think it's really really special so what do you do for fun like we know that you love your work and that you're really this creative creative person who's also a geek who's also gifted who's got all these things going on and we all got to do stuff that kind of helps us be free a little bit from all the stress of what we do even though you're finding entertainment in the entertainment industry what do you do for fun during the apocalypse is what i've been calling it um during the covid crisis i have um taken up uh, a hobby that my husband has had for his whole life, but I, I picked it up throwing axes. So yeah, so I, I throw axes. I go uh, on walks. I like. I, I really enjoy a good visit with friends. You know, I, I can't. I can't speak enough to uh, you know to hanging out with friends and and you know when you work in the entertainment industry, like people are like, oh, why don't you go to a show? I'm like, no, that sounds like going to work. <laughs> like, there's definitely been times where I was, you know, at a show and accidentally started taking apart somebody's drum kit because it was sitting next to me for too long. <laughs> and they came up and were like, hi, cute girl in a dress. What are you doing? I'm like, uh, sorry, here's your symbols. Um, in your symbol bag now. I didn't. I. I don't know. I was just reflexively, accidentally touching your stuff. My bad. <laughs> I'm gonna go back over the audience side and not touch strangers' things. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, I suppose I do enjoy a show from time to time. But it just, it just, when you're always in that sort of environment and being like inundated by so many people and so much emotions and so much movement being calm is like like nothing else and i suppose that i find that in throwing axes you know like it's it's a focused activity that i um you know like when we go to tournaments it's not very calm but in my backyard it's very very calm right. <laughs> and i and it and i get pretty zen back there so yeah so those those oh and i also for the apocalypse took up uh, saying happy birthday to everybody I know. So I often get on the piano that's right behind me and sing happy birthday for everybody. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. You know, because people don't sing happy birthday that much anymore. They'll say it or they'll put the little Facebook stuff up that you hardly ever like hear the song very much unless right. you're having like a big party. So that's beautiful. Yeah. That's a cool little gift. I like it. Right. I know. That's like so fun. So I always tell everybody that um, our gifts turned up too loud is what creates overwhelm. And 
getting burned out. You know, like you can take something that's really amazing about ourselves and we can turn them up so loud and do them so much and get so amped up that it actually works against us. And, and I'm wondering how that is in your industry. I, I imagine that it's possible to have like too much stuff going on with all the lights and everything. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> For sure. Um, you know, when I was in, in geometry and like, I don't know, grade I was in seventh grade or whatever it was, uh, the geometry teacher said to kiss, you know, keep it simple, stupid. And I was like, oh my, I got to keep a hold of that. Yeah. And, um, every time, every time throughout my career that I've tried to get like a little too out of hand, you know, it comes back and reminds me that like keeping it simple makes it so much easier to read, you know, like keeping a simple theme that you, you know, have in the verse that you change just a little bit for the chorus. And then you go back to whatever it is that you started with at the verse. You know, maybe maybe you can, you know, do a bit of variation. But if you start getting real out of hand and it doesn't match what's happening, then then it it's discording and you know disassociating and it and it makes makes the music not make sense anymore because the lights don't make sense to what's happening anymore. Because the lights really play much more into the experience, I think, than a lot of people realize. And unless you step back a little bit or you, you have the understanding and awareness. Now you work with all these very eccentric and often kind of demanding and maybe people who aren't necessarily in that moment, the kindest ever, or maybe they're overly, whatever they're doing, all these different personalities, we're going to put it that way. Right. And, uh, and your job is to direct like the essence of their show. Like they're going to play their music and do their craft, but if the lighting is terrible, then people are going to walk away understanding that, you know, they're going to have that in their memory about that artist. And so I'm sure you've dealt with some really wild kinds of personalities, requests and ways of handling it. So how do you handle the challenging, difficult artists that you had to deal with over the years? How do you handle all of that? Um, I mean, to be fair, I think, you know, and it, that's definitely been a place of growth um, as, as I've gone on. Uh -huh. um, uh, there's definitely, uh, I remember once while I was on tour having, having some feedback where they were like, every day the lights look different. Like we could have just gone with house people. I'm like, well, every day I get a whole new rig and all I'm carrying is a light board. And sometimes I'm not doing that. I'm like doing video every day. Like that's about it. And like that changes and, you know, I, I couldn't explain it at the time, but I felt like saying like, this is the drummer. I felt like being like, well, how about we give you some wood and you construct a drum kit and get that going by the end of the show, you know, by the end of soundcheck and you have the same show every, every day with starting from scratch you know and also like on that same tour um one of the people uh you know wanted to do yoga all the time and wanted to go to starbucks no matter how late we were to a gig and so i accommodated that <laughs> and we did yoga whenever he wanted all the time and i love him for it and you know uh Pretty much every time I do yoga, I think a little bit about him, and um, I and you know I I love and adore him for it. Um, so you know I think a lot of those kinds of kinds of things are just opportunities to grow and figure out how to communicate with your fellow person. You know, yeah, that's cool to listen to what it is that they're saying and hopefully not react fully. <laughs> right. Hey, and go with it to a certain extent, as long as it's something that's doable, that goes with right. what you're doing. If they're asking you to do something that's unrealistic, communicate it clearly, that kind of thing, you know? Yeah, and, exactly. 
And sometimes those kind of wild personalities are entertaining. And when, you know, from the very beginning of the show, when you said that, it's like with that kind of mindset, it gives you a lot more flexibility, right? Where you're not like, you know, and that makes it so that you're having more fun. And then therefore everything goes smoother behind the scenes, which makes it a really amazing experience for everybody. Because I'm sure you get jazzed up when the show's done and it like rocked it, right? And everything. Oh, yeah. And the audience was into it and the lighting was perfect and nothing went out and everything was good. It's an adrenaline rush, I imagine, right? Yeah. I mean, like the first, the first real big show that I got to do coming back um, where I was running lights was Go Go Bordello. And I love their energy is Mm -hmm. always, always off the charts. And, um, and, you know, I, I had a, a little mosh pit for one at the light board. Um, and, uh, and, you know, so much so that a friend of mine that I invited to hang out with me at front of house, like started videotaping. <laughs> she was like, Oh my gosh, this is what you do back here. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I mean, like not always, not everybody makes inspires me to have a mosh pit for one, but, uh, you know, go, go Bordello does. And, and, um, you know, when I got finished with that, I was, I was high. Like I, you know, I had to, I had to take my pants off. Like I have, I have shorts underneath my pants and like two minutes in, I realized that my sea wrench and all of my stuff that's in my work pants were going to interfere with this mosh pit. And I had to, I had to get them out of there, get them off. So I took them off. And then afterward I was talking to the front of house guy. And I was like, oh, man, that was so good. I had to take my pants off. And he was like, our old front of house guy, our old lighting guy, he used to just play in his underwear. And I was like, well, if you ever need me to go follow around the world with you and do lights in my underwear, I'd be happy to work that out. (laughs) Oh, my God. I love that. That is hysterical. That is really, really fun. So what is the most memorable food you've ever eaten on all of these trips and tours and life you've had all around the world and stuff? And everywhere you've been, there's always that memorable food that stands out. And so what is the most memorable food that you have eaten? I don't know. I've had some really, really amazing sushi on tour. That is definitely one of my favorites to go get sushi and spend as much money as humanly possible in sushi so where's your favorite where's your favorite sushi place the place um, pops in your head that you go oh that sushi's great yeah uh let's see there was a really really great one um in toronto um just down the street from the venue that had like like a whole like 10 course meal that was affordable of sushi that just kept coming and showing up and showing up. And I was like, I don't understand. Uh, but I am thrilled that you guys just keep bringing me sushi that I don't, I don't recall actually asking for. <laughs> and like, they just, it just kept showing up. And, and that was, that was really great. Sweet. Oh, I love it. I love sushi too. I've had a lot of people, I ask that question on and off to people who I know have been on tour and been around, you know, in lots of different places. And several people have said sushi in different areas and different places in different ways that, that still, that, you know, that they remember that, that taste and everything. Yeah. So I have another question a little bit, that's a little bit on the personal side, but it kind of goes with all of this because I'm really curious. I, I teach everybody about being a lighthouse and shining their light from the inside out and letting themselves like show up in the world with their own spiritual integrity, their own authority and quit playing small. And I'm getting goosebumps now. And as when I think about you and the work you do and just how I just really love your presence, like every time I've ever interacted with you, I'm like, Oh, I always, I'm always done interacting with you when I have smiling And so if you were going to light somebody from that, we want them to be showing from the inside out like that. We want them to be like the lighthouse. So the light doesn't necessarily appear that it's lights because we want it to go from the inside out so that the audience sees that person's brilliance. Right. Is that something that is possible 
with external lights? Or does the person have to just really be so in their own alignment and just so projecting it out there that the lights are just like a secondary kind of thing? Or how does that, how does that work? Mm -hmm. I don't even know if I'm making sense in the question, but I'm trying to like, because I've traveled with people and I've been on tour with musicians and, and I've noticed that some of the external lighting kind of matches that person just bring in the, bring in the game. This all out here they are and they're putting all everything on the table and it kind of goes and other times it's like, Oh, that's kind of cool. Like I like it. It's great. But then I was wondering what if somebody's like really good or maybe they're okay, but we want to make them look better or whatever. Is there a way to do that? Or do they really need to bring it and the light is more of a compliment? Uh, no, I think, I think, uh, I think the, the, the light could probably, you know, pull that off. You know, I think depending on what colors you're using with their skin tones in the front and what kinds of, like if you're side lighting, uh, uh, like a lot of soft side lighting is really helpful. Up lighting, usually not really going to kick it off, you know, like it's good for a second and, and for a lot of impact, but, um, but, you know, to have it, hanging out there it makes our brains super confused so you know so um so the direction is is really helpful okay. okay and um and and the color quality so like uh you know um a lot of warm on the skin is usually pretty good um um cooler tends to um make us think that maybe they're sick Kind of washes um, them out a little bit, like yeah, yeah. Exactly. Okay, exactly. all right, all right. Green, if like if there's like a green hue in in the front lighting, then they're they're definitely gonna look sick. Yeah. So, well, uh, you turn uh, green when you're seasick. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So if you see that, uh, you know, you're gonna be like, oh, what are they gonna throw up? Like, what's what's happening here? You know, um, and uh, you know, um. But like, uh, I think I think the backlighting has has a lot of um, a lot of uh, impact on stage because it's you know what we typically use um, for the color right to like match um, the mood and and all of that and and that's more often than not where all the lights are right so like um, Buzzo whose band's name just disappeared from my head. I thought I had memory problems. I don't know. Anyway, um, Buzzo has this amazing head of hair. Uh, plays in a metal band of some kind. All of his fans, I'm sure, are going to, uh, you know, in the comments, uh, shred me for not remembering who they are. Uh, maybe my husband will be really nice to come in and be like, you can remember who this band is. But anyway, the point is, like he has this amazing head of hair. And so uh, I always en enjoyed immensely being able to light his him from the back and being able to see his hair like a halo uh, changing colors with with my lights. So, um, you know, if you conveniently have an afro about, you know, three feet tall, uh, that can look pretty rad um, <laughs> like a halo. Like Christ like and stuff like that, you know. So. Oh, that, that's really, really cool. So if somebody's listening to you right now and they're thinking, you know, I always been curious about all this entertainment industry and lighting and and or just entertainment industry in general. And they were thinking, you know, maybe I want to work in that industry or get involved in it somehow. And they're kind of toying around with the idea. And they want to put their toe in the water. Do you have any advice for those people, like for the for the people who are interested and maybe maybe they were doing something else and want to start doing that now or or whatever? Like, what would you tell the newbie? Yeah, I tell them go give it a shot. Don't get hurt. This is a very dangerous activity. Keep your hands inside of the the vehicle at all times. Wear your helmet. You know, wear put your gloves on. Uh, pay attention. Um, you know, we get smashed and bashed a lot, setting stuff up. There's a lot of moving parts, a lot of people not paying attention. There's a lot of newbies. I have no idea that this 
thing on wheels as we're setting up is going to smash into people's ankles or run people's toes over. So, you know, get some steel toes. Um, um, be mindful of when people are telling you that you need to be wearing personal protective equipment, you know, um, and, and give it a shot. You know, uh, there's the International Alliance of Theatrical and Stage Employees all over the United States and Canada. And, uh, uh, you know, go to the local nearby you and see if they are uh, accepting applications and give them a shot. And, uh, you know, if, if not there, there's lots of, uh, there's lots of uh, opportunities all over the world as well to, uh, to go give it a try, you know. Um, you could, you know, probably look up staging on the Google and find, you know, all kinds of different uh, companies that are, you know, supplying stage crew and, uh, and you can go give it a try. And, you know, if you, if you're pretty good at paying attention, you'll probably, you know, make it as long as you want to. That's, um, yeah. 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 I like that. Pay attention. You know, like I, I think of it all the time when you teach people racing boats and everything, pay attention to what you're affecting. And when you were talking about the lighted thing, moving on wheels and running over people, I'm like, pay attention to what you're affecting. I, in all the cases, in all of life. And, and that when you were just speaking, that's what I was thinking about. Like, you know, yes, go, go for it, go after it, put your foot in the water, go try it out. Absolutely. And pay attention, listen, you know, heads up, you know, because yeah. it's, it's necessary it's not, it's not easy and all as glamorous as people might think it is. It's very hard work and it's great and it's exciting and it's entertaining and it's hard work, you know, yeah. and, and I, I know how hard it is and yeah. I'm like, yeah, it's not, there's nothing easy about it. And you're having to think somebody like you is directing things as people you have to help coordinate and then you're directing things and you're creating things and you have to pay attention to all of this, the technical pieces of this as well, all at the same time. And yeah. if you're not paying attention, it's not going to be pretty. No. Yeah. I mean, a lot of times I, I explain to people that my job is that I move heavy things for a living. Yes. You know? <laughs> and, and for the most part, you know, we take little boxes and put them inside of bigger boxes and put those inside of bigger boxes until it's into a truck you know, that's towing a box and that moves around to a, you know, a stage, which is a box and we empty all those boxes out and we put them back in and we <laughs> send it on this next adventure. And so, you know, it's just a big cycle of, of, um, setting things up and tearing them down. And, you know, even in our, uh, other, um, uh, entertainment industry, uh, realms, you know, if you're, if you're in film or TV, um, you know, likewise, you're setting up, something that you're going to tear back down and you might reuse those pieces. Um, you know, so it's just a whole lot of moving around heavy stuff. Um, and, um, that's definitely the less glamorous part. Right. <laughs> but, yes. um, when I, when I decided when I was in uh, high school that I should pursue this, it wasn't just the letter from Bill Clinton. That was definitely, definitely a huge sinker. But um, <laughs> I was like, this has a physical element, a mental element, emotional element. Like this has like all of the parts that I feel like I'll be able to, to feel fulfilled in my life. And, uh, and so far so good. Right. And it's got the spiritual intuition element too. that, that, yeah. you know, you appreciate now that you probably didn't even think about back then, but it, care, right. it covers all your major life areas right. and where you can have a sense of fulfillment and challenge in them, which all gifted people need a sense of challenge. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. Now changing a little bit here, I want to talk about your belief in serving your community and serving other people because you're a service oriented leader. You pay attention to giving back. It's very important to you. And and I've heard, I hear a lot of judgment on the street, you know, people in the entertainment industry don't really care about other people. That's not my experience. I know lots of people in the entertainment industry and I've yet to run into, I know they, I know they're out there. They're just not in my world yet. Right. So right. Share, share a little bit about your belief in the importance of giving back to your community and, and some of the things that are just important to you. So people understand where your heart is a little more. All right. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, 
I try to figure out whatever way it is that I can to help out other people and, um, and take that action. Like, so, um, one of the first ways that I started doing that, um, uh, was, um, like I was, I was noticing all the people, um, uh, that would be asking for spare change right on the, on the highway. And, um, and I would have, um, I'd get, uh, um, you know, for my dentist, I'd get like the toothbrushes and toothpaste and stuff like that. And, and I'd have it in the car. So I'd be like, Oh, Hey, would you like this? And, um, I've, I've had one person turn that down. Uh, and I, I mean, like, even I remember one time somebody being like, I don't have teeth. I'm like, right. But would your gums like to be brushed? And he was like, you know what? That's a really good idea. Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, so I, 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 I like to take it from wherever I can. Um, also like during the, uh, the, the apocalypse, um, during the COVID crisis, um, you know, I had all of these stage hands, um, asking what to do about unemployment. And, um, I gone through unemployment for myself, for my husband and for my kid. I'd like gone through and gathered all of our stuff together and I made an Excel sheet. And so, um, so then I just made a blank one so that I could spread it around to the other folks that needed that information. And, um, and then I ended up uh, on the Oregon Employment Department's um, paid family medical leave insurance benefit work group um, and advised them as to how uh, they could have paid, um, you know, pay out those benefits in beneficial ways, hopefully, for um, all workers with, you know, my particular work set um being a really big outlier they were like oh wow you mean people can have multiple jobs like w2 and 1099 like yeah not only can they do that they can have like more than three because three was like their like big number they were like three is a multiple worker i was like oh man i have 15 w2s and 1099s at the end of the year every year what are you talking about three and then I was talking to another really good friend of mine and she was like, I got 90. And I was like, oh my gosh. So, you know, I just took my experiences um, and my coworkers' experiences and shared them with the employment department, hoping that when they pull it off doing um, family leave insurance, that it's equitable and uh, fabulous. So, um, so I did things like that. I also ran for um, president of my local, the International and Psychiatrical Stage Employees Local 28. And, um, you know, because uh, it was needed and and I stepped up and um, I feel like I did a pretty all right job <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and did a whole lot of, of uh, created a good and welfare committee. Um, uh, we talked about good and welfare a lot um at the end of the meeting which is uh you know robert's rules is you know it's format right but um we decided that we needed a committee to actually address those things and make sure that when people pass away that we have a group of people that aren't just the executive board looking towards how we can make sure that uh you know that they're celebrated and that if people are sick that they're uh you know got as have as many resources as we can find. So I have a, a, a resource um, a page that I have on a Google Doc that I share with all kinds of folks, a financial resource and emotional resources that are um, industry-based so that they can uh, you know, find whatever tools they need that they might need help with. Oh, that's great. And that's a, a really powerful way to be of service without waiting for someone else to tell you how to do it or to go join a thing necessarily. Like, yes, those kinds of Google Docs with here, these are the resources. If somebody's motivated for them or they need them and you share the link with them or tell them about it, 
then they can do with it whatever, you know, take action on it in whatever way serves them the best. And that that's a really good example of taking that that heart of yours that wants to just serve and do the right thing and doing something tangible that's meaningful without it being like over the top. I think some people rule themselves out from serving other people because they think it's like another job or another big thing they have to add, or it's just too much. And we're already, already spent. And so many people are afraid. There's all these emotions these days that, that overwhelm, I think stops somebody. So I think that's a really good idea that people can grab a hold of listening to you. Like, you know, open up a, a spreadsheet and just start putting down the things you know, because somebody out there in the world doesn't know it yet. And they would value yeah. that information. Cause I'll bet you've had people who you share that with and you're thinking, well, I just researched it and found it, but they, they can't or won't or can't find it in the same way. And it's just so relieving to have everything in one place for them. That's a really good. That's a really nice thing that you do that I think is very service oriented. So is there anything else, anything that you wanted to share in the show that I didn't ask you about? I have one final question, but I always like to make sure that my guests feel totally happy and satisfied with our little conversation. So is there anything that I didn't talk about that you would like to share about? If so, let me know. If not, that's okay too. You don't, I'm not, it's not a requirement. I just want to make sure that when we're done, you feel complete. Yeah, I feel like this has been a pretty amazing catharsis. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Yeah, most people say I ask questions they've never been asked before and certainly not in the way they're used to. So they're like, oh, okay. Um, I say, well, that's the gift of intuition for you. So the last question then is this. If we were going to put a billboard up that the whole world would see with Rhiannon's quote on it to inspire the world, what would your quote be for that billboard? The time is now. Ah, beautiful. The time is now. I love it. I love it. Look at that. It's perfect. Perfect. All right. So everybody, you've been listening to Rihanna Rodriguez Betts, cool lighting expert, director, neat service person, great sense of humor. She's a really pers- cool person. So all her links or bios in the, sh- in the show notes. And you can follow her on social media and let her know you heard her here. So thank you, Rihanna, for being on the show. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy time to spend time having this conversation. I feel so enlightened. I feel, I just, I feel like I know something more than I didn't before. And I've always appreciated lighting. And now I appreciate it with a different depth. Thanks to you um, sharing so authentically. So thank you so much. Yeah, you're absolutely welcome. Thank you for having me. Wow, this has been great. So remember, everybody, keep your face to the sun so the shadows fall behind you because you're a rock star. You're here on purpose with a purpose. So go out there and let your light shine. And until the next episode of Someone Gets Me, be well. Thank you for listening. I trust you gained some valuable inspiration and information. Please join me and other visionaries in the Someone Gets Me Facebook group. Or for more information on my services and additional episodes, visit someonegetsme.com. Again, thanks for listening.